newzealandmusician.co.nz I would like to welcome up uh, in uh, our NZ musician offices uh, Jesse Wilde and Ed Taylor who perform as Wilde Taylor and have just officially released their, is it is it your debut album it as is. such? Yes. Um, and it's called um, I wrote it down, I wrote it down. Don't blame it on me. And right. we've been listening to, to it a lot here in the office, so we're really happy to have you up here. Now, Ed, can you please introduce yourself a little bit and your musical background? Right, um, my name's Ed Taylor. Uh, I am a guitar player and a bit of harmonica and percussion and stuff. I, uh, I studied classical guitar at Auckland University. I think I finished about 2000. So I got a degree in performance guitar. Then I uh, went into a bit of jazz and pop music and stuff and then um, Played in all sorts of different bands. Finally, I met up with this young man over here about a year and a half ago, and uh, I played at a place in um, Newmarket called the Lumsden, and I needed a, a new singer. And so I got this guy here, and we sort of hit it off, and then um, Wild Taylor emerged from the uh, the mist, and we did our album, and yeah, it's all good. And here you are. How about you, Jesse? What have you done before Wild Taylor? Oh, quite a bit. I don't have formal education like this man. <laughs> Although I did, do, I did do one year in Maine, so I'd already been playing professionally for about seven years before I did that. Um, I came, f I started playing professionally about 17, I guess, underage in bars, had a band called Acoustic Attitude. Back then the drinking age was 20, and but we, um, yeah, I got, pretty much from our first gig, we got a residency and we were playing three nights a week and I feel like I've been doing that since I was 17, uh, <laughs> now um, into my 40s. And um, so I played Acoustic Attitude was my first band. We made an, an album and toured up and down the country. Then I went over to America and I got to meet my favorite songwriters, uh, which was pretty awesome. I had my first solo album out then. I met John Mellencamp, Bob Seger, and Steve Earle when I was over in America. And then came back here, formed another band, <clears throat> which we ended up calling Jesse Wilde and the Drive. <clears throat> there was a few other bands in between that, had a few duos. And then I met Ed um, when I was building a studio right next door. And uh, yeah, it, we sort of hit it off, started playing some covers and then um, Ed had some originals and I had a few originals that I wanted to rework and then I had a couple of one new one. And we put the album together. One of the first albums we started recording in the brand new recording studio right next door to New Zealand Musician Magazine. That's right, actually, I, I, uh, let's, get to back, back, let's get back to that a little bit later on. I sort of wanted to start the interview with just asking some general questions yeah. for younger musicians to maybe get some, you know, to get some info out of it and then uh, get into the album cool. after that. So, um, obviously, you both have been making music for a very long time and you've been in many different bands and worked with a lot of different people. What do you think makes a band worth sticking with? Like For me it's chemistry is a very important thing. Friendship is also a really important thing and it's got to be fun. You know if you've got chemistry, friendship and it's fun and it, then it doesn't feel like work and uh, that's you know and we always have fun when we're playing live don't we? we sure do. Yeah I mean I've been in a lot of bands where there's been issues, personality issues and it always <laughs> doesn't end so well you know so personality is a real big thing so if you get along with a person that's a big thing but I guess reliability yeah. is, as well if yeah, someone doesn't true. turn up yeah. it ruins everything <laughs> so, <laughs> reliability is up there too <laughs> that's right um, a lot of younger musicians I talk to say but there are not enough opportunities to play um, um, I know that's not fully correct because I know you guys you play a lot very frequently how do you find those opportunities? Often it takes uh, a lot of walking around the streets begging people, pretty much going from bar to bar asking. Um, once you get into one place then often that will snowball and more and more will come of it. But I mean I, there's been a lot of times where I've walked around with my CD and my CV and gone from bar to bar to bar and just asked people, hey would you like some live music, you know. And to start with you might not get that much money, but you just keep going and keep going and, and uh, gradually hopefully something happens but you got to be a bit diverse as well you can't say right this is what I just play originals that's it 
and I'm not prepared to do anything else. You've got to be, you know, you've got to work with the, the bar owners or the, or the venues that you're trying to get the work from, you know. Why do you think a lot of people frown upon playing covers? Because I think that's silly. That's how you draw in people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I pretty, a lot of people think that it, it sort of crushes your artistic integrity if you're just playing other people's music. But you know, like we we play at a, at a bar uh, every Sunday, and uh, people go there for like it's an afternoon thing. They go there, have a few beers, and have some food. And we play probably eighty percent covers, eh? and yeah. people just want to hear some sort of music in the background. They want to know what the song is, probably, and and they enjoy that, you know. The whole cover thing to me, it's really interesting. So we always put our originals in our set, and and I think it's great, and they always get well received, and we, it helps us sell albums at our gigs. Um, I always look at this, I mean, people who say they don't want to do covers, I mean, I have had bands where we've just done originals, and that was our thing, and we did fest, the festival circuit, and we did, but the gigs were very limited for that. But I always look at the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, I mean, the two, one of the two, two of my absolute favourite bands, started as pure cover bands, both of them, that's all they ever did. And the Rolling Stones still do covers when they're touring, they still do Temptations, and they do a bunch of covers, and so... Uh, to, to, to completely rule that out, I think, is, is, is nuts. Yeah. So, uh, and, and doing covers helps me write songs, too. It gives me an idea, you know, and, 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 and you woo them with a couple of covers, then you sneak your one in, and then you get people to, to the effect that you're, when your originals start sounding um, to them like covers, they can sound completely original, but to them, oh, I've heard this before, I've heard this before, I like the song, we're starting to get requests for our originals, and that's, I think that's the way to do it. So. What do you think does it take to make someone a lifer? I get this all the time because owning a studio and I, people ask me, yeah, you've done it all your life. There's one thing that makes, in my opinion, that makes it a lifer is uh, you've got to absolutely love it. And I always tell people, they, they say, oh, how do you? I say, if you don't love it, you'll never stick at it long enough. I mean, you've got to love it so much that <laughs> quitting is not an option. And in fact, Bob Seger, one of my absolute favorite writers, he quit several times. He quit the music industry. He had seven albums out before he got a hit. But in the end, he couldn't quit because that love just made him get back into it. There's nothing else that gave him that high. Nothing with your clothes on, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> nothing as much fun with the clothes on. That's, that's what I reckon. <laughs> don't, don't blame it on me. Your album was... Well, you kind of... The print version was there late last year, wasn't it? And then digitally it came out in January. And now officially it's been out since just a couple of weeks or something. Yeah. yeah. How come you didn't just release it all at the same time? That's a good question. <laughs> well, it, you know, people... It's interesting. People have this thing about marketing. You're supposed to you know, have the album ready six months before you release it for all the marketing and stuff. But really, we just had so many gigs on and stuff, we wanted to have an official release date. And we ended up doing that in February because we had a bunch of gigs around Christmas. And it was only just like the print version. I made some test prints in because I, I can print my own CDs and they look pretty good in the studio. But the actual official uh, proper ones that came from Stebbings and, and, the, and the printer and everything, they're only just before Christmas, like two days before Christmas and um, there's no point releasing it then and we had a bunch of stuff happening in January we just needed to find a date where we could go and we wanted to have the release party in, in our own venue so that's pretty much why but we did actually bootleg our own album so we, we were selling them we were selling them at gigs and saying you know we bootlegged our own album before anyone else gets a chance to but yeah it's starting to take off and we're getting some really good feedback about it um, and, and it, we've got physical copies available mainly from our gigs, but you can go to our website or Facebook page and we'll post them out to you. We, we don't, well, we haven't even approached any shops yet, but we, we might slip it into Real Groovy. I'm pretty sure they'll take it, um, certainly on all the digital platforms now. How about the vinyl? Well, <laughs> <laughs> <Jesse>. <laughs> I knew you'd ask about that. Because I've been so busy, I have been cutting some test pressings or uh, test lathings on my vinyl lathe which I got from Germany and um, just being a little bit it's such a hands-on process and um, I you know I, I, I'd say give me a month or so and I'll, I'll lathe some copies we might do a vinyl release in our venue as well and um, hand lathe vinyl I don't think we're going to get any pressed vinyl at this stage 
um, depending on how it goes. But this is my, my love for making vinyl. And um, yeah, it's a big, big step. In fact, anyone out there who wants to learn how to make vinyl and who's really keen and has got time, uh, I've actually already been approached from our interview on Radio New Zealand, someone who did this amazing thing where they, they made a vinyl record, they made a, on a, on a beer bottle. <laughs> it was a New Zealand company that did it for, for Beck, I think it was, for Beck's beer. I was in New Zealand, and he approached me, and they'd already talked to the um, Ulrich Sori from Germany, uh, and um, they seemed they were really interested in the lathe. So hopefully, I, I want to team up with somebody because I don't want to be the main person always lathing, and it's a very hands on time. You need an apprentice. <laughs> if you're watching this and you want to learn how to lathe, uh, get in touch with Jason. A young, cheap apprentice. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, the album itself was actually recorded and produced by Jesse. Um, what was your biggest challenge when doing the job yourself? Well, to start with, it was co-produced. Um, Ed definitely oh. produced it. Um, definitely had a lot of say in everything. Um, what were the biggest challenges? I certainly engineered the album, except with my vocals, which um, when I Ed engineered those because I, I couldn't be in two rooms at once. And I taught Ed how to how to how to press the, the sliders and how to press the buttons. Um, what what's the biggest challenges for you? What do you think? Making the album. I think it was really good. I mean, I've I've done albums before where we've done it in a recording studio uh, with a certain amount of hours and you've got to get it done or else you, that's just mm. it and that really limits the the way you play I, I reckon whereas we, with me and Jesse we just did like one sort of two or three hour session a week over maybe six months so we could come in do it listen to it take it away listen to it maybe do it again if we didn't like it you know and uh, and so we, we ended up with something that we were really happy with you know so I think it was a great way of doing it rather than hiring out a, 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 a big studio with an engineer and for 10,000 bucks and saying okay you got two days here we go you know and that's tough doing that it's too much pressure some people thrive under that though don't they uh, so yeah, it's the maybe, other thing yeah. if you're a perfectionist you go no not good enough <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. let's do it again we've got to do and it again <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How, how autobiographical are the songs because I recognize some of the songs from your Jesse Wilde album Jesse yeah. from your previous release which hasn't been on for very long either. No, no. Um, how, how, how autobiographical are they because I listen to them and I go oh there's actually a real story there mm. um, well, my songs, um, Magdalene was an, a very, um, it's, it's a song about, a, um, I had a past, well, I, I had a gypsy woman who did a reading on me, and um, that's exactly how it happened, <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it made for a really good story. Apparently in a past life I was a musketeer, I'm not saying I believe this or not, but it made a great story, and um, so and I ain't gonna let you. It was is 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 it was a real story about uh, the mother of my child, and um, that was I wrote that at like two o'clock in the morning quite a few years ago. So I reworked a few songs because I really liked the the way that um, Ed interpreted them, and he changed a couple of chords here and there, changed keys, and 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 it was really nice. And I was so busy building our building, I didn't have time to write any new songs. Um, <laughs> Please Don't Leave was written uh, when, my, when I was sitting trying to write songs because I was actually making an attempt. You have to literally make time to write songs. And, um, and I was, I was kind of happy. You know, when you're happy, you don't write songs. I, <laughs> I don't. And I found a lot of songwriters don't. And I was saying this to my wife, I'm too happy in my life. I mean, I've got everything I've ever wanted sort of thing. And then my wife said, I'm leaving you. <laughs> and, she, and she stormed out the door. And uh, she was only joking. But um, I did, you know, I sort of knew, but then I wrote a song as if that had happened, and that's what Please Don't Leave's about. So, um, and then Ghost Town Road is very autobiographical, as when I was driving down Route 66. So that's me, but yeah, I know your songs are different. Yeah, 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 yeah mine are completely not autobiographical. So I, I will find someone or see somebody in life and sort of construct a little story in my head about them for example the song a long time ago 
I went to the mall and I saw a guy there that I used to know about 20 or 30 years ago when I first went to university and he was like this cool dude who was just the suavest guy in the world, you know, and he, and things obviously hadn't gone so well 25 years later. And then I sort of just constructed this little story about what had happened to him, not knowing any of the facts, I didn't, you know, I didn't actually know what had happened to him, but I just sort of make up these little stories in my head. I find it, I, I'm not, I find it, it's too personal if you write exactly about yourself, I find that a bit awkward. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. less self centered <laughs> And you should never let the story, the, the, like, the truth get in the way of the no, story. No, no, yeah. it's all right, it's all right. <laughs> May I ask what guitars you guys are predominantly using, live and um, in the studio? Absolutely. I, I use uh, probably two main guitars, but I have an Ovation Elite Collector Series. 1990. It's a bird's eye maple top, 24 frets. I've had that since I bought it in 1990 from Harborn and Arthur's, which is no longer there on Ponsonby Road. And that's been my main guitar forever, my stage guitar. Um, I use, I have a Takamimi as well, which is really nice. It's actually was a prototype for Glenn Fry's um, signature series. And I, I do love that uh, for its acoustic qualities, but my stage, they're my two main guitars. I have a Fender Strat as well, which I haven't used on this album. Mm-hmm. And I have a really nice um, semi, well, uh, what do you call it, sort of Gibson 335 as well. Yeah, yeah on, on the album, for the acoustic parts, I, I have a Lara V, a beautiful Canadian guitar, which I bought from Bungalow Bills in Auckland. Um, and then for the electric parts, I've got a, a real beautiful little uh, George Benson Ibanez GB10 chord, which is uh, his signature guitar. I bought that, I think it's from the 80s, my one. Um, I bought it second hand around two. It's a jazz guitar. Yeah, right? it's a beautiful jazz guitar, real, but very versatile as well. It's, yeah, it's my favourite little toy, that thing. <laughs> You've got a Fender amp as well, do you? Yeah, I've got a Fender Hot Rod Deluxe amp, which is a, you know, Another thing that George Benson uses, uh, so I always was a big George Benson fan, so that was sort of my go-to, that, his sound. Yeah. Cool, I, I, I know what you could just talk about gear for hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's get that sorry about that. No, no, don't be sorry, I, I, yeah. I love that, I, yeah. I love, and I, I know people appreciate it because you listen to the music yeah, and yeah. you wonder what, what causes the sound. I, I'm interested in this. I just have one thing about the ovation. I, I never really liked ovations for when I first sort of saw them and I hadn't played them before. But I was looking for a particular sound and my absolute favourite album when I bought that just let that track go past. <laughs> when I bought that when I bought that guitar, my absolute favourite album was Bob Seeger's um, what's called Nine Tonight and it's a live album. And there's and I didn't know because I never I, I think I must have had a like a taped copy or something of it. Um, I got it in vinyl many years later, um, so I didn't actually see any photos of that album or anything. But I'd been looking for that sound, and I plugged in the Salvation. I strummed it, and I, I like Night Moves. He plays that that, and that was the exact sound. And then I saw a photo many years later when I had the album cover. There's three Ovations in that band. Ovations back in back in the, I guess in, the, in that time when that was recorded, which was like the early 80s or late 70s, was, was one of the main stage guitars before Jack and Mimi kind of took over. Now there's lots. So that was, I was just looking for a particular sound and I played it in the wing. That's the sound I like. Now, um, a next question. What's um, your next big ambition as a band? Well, yeah, I mean, my dream is to have a band that's fully functioning to the point where it's a viable job. No, that's a hard. That's a hard thing to do. <coughs> but that's a um, realistic ambition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I've done it. And, um, yeah, you know, we've both done it in the past. Yeah. But to to you know be at a certain level where you can be, you know, not only playing three or four times a week, but going to festivals, playing concerts. You know, not just playing in bars, which can get a bit tiresome after. 30 years <laughs> but um, you know doing festivals and stuff like that and proper concerts proper tours and, and making enough I mean you know you're, not, you're never going to make a million bucks out of it, but, but uh, enough to never say never of, or maybe we are <laughs> <laughs> never say never yeah. uh, I guess we've started doing these little mini tours and things like that and we're starting to get a few festivals as well 
Um, we're playing the Taste of Matarangi and we're playing up at the old Bay of Islands Country Rock Festival. And um, But getting out there and selling the, the, the record, I, I think face-to-face -face meeting people, getting out of Auckland and, and you know, you go away for three or four days, come back with, you know, some really awesome experiences. We've made some people happy. We've sold a bunch of albums. That to me, maybe taking it overseas, and I've got a few contacts in America, and um, we're already getting some feedback from America. The two musicians on the album were actually one's from uh, North Carolina, and one's the, the drummer's from North Carolina. He also played most of the bass on the record. We used a Kiwi on, on one of the songs, and um, the keyboard player is from Mississippi. And um, that we had an awesome violinist on the album who's a, who's a Kiwi. Most of the, the rest of it were Kiwis. Standard violinist. Yeah, that's a really good song. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the times we play as a duo, and more and more we play as a trio with the violin player. We've never really played with the full band like yeah. we did uh, did on the record. Um, but it's interesting because we started this record with a with a band, um, some friends of Ed's. And I guess because we weren't out there touring and playing all the time, it didn't just quite quite click, but it was amazing um, pre-production. And then we went back to basically guitar and vocals, and then we sent it away to, because I, I, I use these musicians from America all the time. I find them amazing. We have the best musicians in the world in New Zealand, I truly believe, but they're not working 50 hours a week doing session stuff like these Americans are, and that's the difference. These guys can inter interpret songs in this. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if someone is out there working 50 hours a week <laughs> uh, sure doing 50, session I'm, stuff. I'm pretty sure there are a few people who yeah. live from being session musicians. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd much, yeah. like to meet those people. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well, that can be done. <laughs> now, um, uh, one last chance to pitch yourself. Who should check out your music? Who will do you think will love you? You take that, right? I think, <laughs> for me, uh, I see our music as sounding like music that I listened to when I was a kid so it's maybe it is for young people but I'd say it's from 30 up and it's uh, people who like folk music who like country music who like good old-fashioned rock music that sort of stuff you know it's the young kids I'm not sure if they'll maybe they well, will I actually think we're yeah. getting a lot of comments this album is kind of classic it sounds classic And like a lot of the classic music, like um, is the young kids are still getting into, like yeah. a bit of Cat Stevens and the amazing. You go to Cat Stevens concerts, half full of young people, you know. So I and of course uh, friends of the family and their and their kids and stuff really like the album. Mm. I've gotten so much feedback, you know, people great. Me, if you're going on a road trip, stick the album on on Spotify or buy the CD. Good road trip music, and it, it doesn't take long to grow on you, mm. and it's. It's real. That's all the comments I'm getting as well because we use no electronic instruments on this album at all. So everything's real. And um, and the production is like the only effects they used on the whole album was a little bit of reverb and some compression and that's about it. And so everything there is, is, is real and I wanted to keep it that way and um, using some nice tube preamps to warm up the sound and... Uh, You know, a little bit of tape saturation and things like that to give it that old school sound, and um, it's it's real and it's yeah. I personally think it's for anyone. I mean, the great thing about today, you can go and you can check these things out. You can listen on Spotify, but it doesn't cost you much to do that. And it's funny because I've got two nine-year-old boys and they like rap music, yeah, Post Malone that sort of stuff, and they always say, oh, I don't want to listen to your stuff. And then, but finally, they listen a little bit, and then I catch them singing it quietly away in the yeah. yeah in the shower or whatever when I'm when I, they think that there's no one there so <laughs> it cute. definitely grows on the youngsters as well but it's my 15 year old daughter <laughs> she can sing pretty much every word of the album <laughs> so maybe it is for the youngsters do you have a preferred place to send people to to check it out if they're still watching at this point yeah. well uh Because Spotify, we've got some really cool videos up now on YouTube. We've got our own video, you know, with some live stuff that we've done. Um, it's on iTunes. It's on all the digital platforms. And if you want a hard copy, because I'm a big fan of the hard copy or the vinyl, just contact us through our website, mm -hmm. wildtaylor.com. It's wild with an E. Um, and Taylor yeah. with a Y. Taylor with a Y. <laughs> cool. Yeah, check out YouTube. And we, I made some pretty 
Oh, hard case videos for we've done three music videos that I made for the songs. So, uh, they're not really high budget, but they're the, he made them I solely like them. Uh, recorded and edited on his iPhone. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually really impressed. <laughs> I took a little uh, internet course on video making on iPhone, and uh, it's actually they turned out quite good. But yeah, so mm-hmm. I, I um, YouTube these those three and uh, iTunes puts up all of the songs on YouTube as well, without videos. Have we looked at that? Yeah, yeah, I've seen it, yeah. I didn't know that, yeah, I was asking about that the other day. So YouTube's always good. Cool. And if you want to come down to the Lumsden Free House in Newmarket yeah, on mate. a Sunday, um, from one till four, we'll, we'll be there performing the songs, <laughs> and we are getting up and down the country a little bit, so yeah. on our Facebook page it mentions all of the, yeah. the tour dates and stuff. Yeah. Cool, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you thank for you. having us. Thank you very much. <laughs>